Recently, the world media has reported a renewed escalation of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, represented by Hamas. Diplomats from every country called for a ceasefire, which eventually came about. However, every major player in the Middle East looks at this conflict, and more broadly at the region, through the prism of their own national interests. There have already been many analyses of the causes of this recent conflict. For a good example, I encourage you to check out the excellent analysis by Caspian Report. In this material, let's briefly analyze the perspectives that the main powers in the region, namely the United States, Russia, Iran, China, and Turkey, have on the conflict and on the Middle East at large. Welcome to the 20s Report. This episode's partner is NordVPN. The cybernetic network is one of the fastest growing domains of competition between world powers. However, the fight is also on the individual level for my privacy or yours. VPN will help you cover your digital footprint on the internet and NordVPN offers the best value for money in the market. By purchasing NordVPN from the link in the description, you support the development of good times, bad times. The United States of America The United States of America has been Israel's closest and most unconditional ally for years. Since 1946, the United States has supported Israel with a total of $146 billion. With inflation considered, this amounts to over $240 billion today. Since 2001, Israel has received over 50% of the U.S. foreign military financing fund. And this is despite the fact that Israel is a relatively prosperous country. In fact, Israel's GDP per capita is greater than that of Great Britain, France, or Japan. The Israeli issue has traditionally been a bipartisan topic in Washington. Both Democrats and Republicans have consistently agreed on supporting Israel regardless of its actions. However, in recent years this attitude has changed. Republicans continue to opt for strong support of Israel, as demonstrated by Donald Trump's policy and his close relations with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. This led to Washington's recognition of Jerusalem as the Israeli capital. And we remember how a few weeks ago, President Donald J. Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Mr. President, this will be remembered by our people throughout the ages. And as you just said, Others talked about me. You did it. Some Democrats, however, have started questioning the morality of this unconditional support. One should not look at geopolitics through the prism of morality and values, since it is the pragmatic interests of states that are of paramount importance. However, morality and values are factors that must be taken into account in order to gain domestic support and more and more Americans are skeptical about Israel's policy towards Muslims. This could influence the Biden administration's foreign policy towards Israel and lead to a reduction of unconditional support. Although Biden has expressed direct support for Israel for years, he is now tight-lipped on the matter. The US administration, being a close ally of Israel, is now de facto burdened by the offensive actions of Tel Aviv. Thus, Biden does not directly criticize the Israeli offensive, but calls for a ceasefire by both sides. Unofficially, however, Biden has urged Netanyahu to stop the bombings. Members of the US Congress are beginning to debate the ethics and morality of supplying Israel with weapons that are then used against Palestinians on the West Bank or in the Gaza Strip. There are voices among American analysts opining that, if the Americans finally opted for a more calculated policy towards Israel, Tel Aviv might eventually become involved in diplomacy with its neighbors to a much greater extent than it currently is. This is supported by the United States' policy of limiting its involvement in the Middle East, so as to be able to engage more resources for the competition with China in the Western Pacific. This is evidenced by the withdrawal of U.S. troops from resource-draining Afghanistan. Nevertheless, Washington, in order to maintain its waning dominance, must continually show its presence in the region. So abandoning Israel altogether is not an option. The Russian Federation 
the Middle East has always been the soft underbelly of Russia. Thus, the military intervention of the Russian Federation in Syria, which began in 2015, was an opportunistic return by the Russians to what is, for them, a key region. The Kremlin's strategy in the region is based on a flexible game of influence. Moscow is able to maintain good relations with the main actors in the region – Iran, Israel, Turkey, and the Gulf states – despite the fact that these states often have very different relations with each other. Russia uses all the tools at its disposal – military power, paramilitary organizations, intelligence, trade, and soft power – to expand its influence in the Middle East. The type of tools which Moscow uses means that it gains the greatest influence over the region at times of instability. Therefore, Syria is currently the epicenter of Russia's influence. The strategic location of Syria in the eastern Mediterranean allows the Russians to project power not only deep into the Asian continent, but also into NATO's southeastern flank. The Russians believe that the American presence in the region will decline, which will create a security vacuum that Moscow is eager to fill by increasing its own presence. However, the Russians do not have the tools for economic expansion in the region. Only singular, bilateral economic agreements are possible, and these most often with countries sanctioned by the international community, such as Iran. But back to Israel. Even though Israel is a close ally of the United States, Tel Aviv does not see Russia as an enemy. Both countries share a cultural and historical bond. Thirty years ago, over a million Russian Jews came to Israel, thereby increasing the country's population by 20%. In addition, Israel loudly recalls the role of the Soviet Union in defeating Nazi Germany in World War II, which Moscow greatly appreciates. The direct relationship between Benjamin Netanyahu and Vladimir Putin remains very good. Moscow, despite supporting the al-Assad regime in Syria and fighting alongside Iran and Hezbollah, tries to be as flexible as possible. Officially, it does not support Iranian aggression against Israel. While on the other hand, it turns a blind eye to Israel's attacks on Iranian targets in Syria. At the same time, there are issues on the horizon for Israel and Russia, which will make it difficult for them to find common ground. It's time to end occupation. I don't know such thing as legitimate occupier. Uh, that, that's a new, a new notion for me. These issues include the future of Syria, the Iranian nuclear program, and above all, the Palestinian issue, where the Russians support the creation of an independent Palestinian state. It should be remembered that the Russians do not see the conflict through the prism of its resolution, but rather through the lens of how it will affect Moscow's relations with the parties involved in the conflict. And then, what strategy to adopt to best position itself in the region. In practice, Russia wants to be a mediator. Moscow often invites both sides to talks and wishes to participate in them in order to raise its international position. And it's no different now. The Russians want to take part in talks resolving the conflict, regardless of the format. They propose both direct Palestinian-Israeli talks, with Russia serving as the mediator, and also the convening of a quartet of global mediators, namely the United States, the European Union, the United Nations, and of course, Russia. The Islamic Republic of Iran the issue with Iran is, theoretically, quite simple. Iran and Israel are the fiercest rivals in the Middle East. Both sides clash on many proxy fronts across the region. Unsurprisingly then, Tehran strongly supports the Palestinians in this conflict, and even supports Hamas militarily. The top Iranian commander, General Ismail Khani, said that this is not just a fight against Hamas, but the whole Islamic world. Iran is calling for a referendum on Palestine to determine the fate of the Palestinian. However, when viewed from a broader perspective, particularly with regard to Iran's nuclear program, there is a significant conflict of interest for all players. Israel has warned for years that nuclear weapons in the hands of the fanatical Tehran regime represent the greatest threat in the region. Iran, in turn, declares that it is developing the program for defensive purposes. 
Now, the sanctions imposed on Iran by the Trump administration have deeply affected its economy, but have not prevented the continuation of its nuclear program. In addition, they have mobilized Tehran to seek its own leverages of power and to continue to develop its network of proxy militias, many of which are aimed directly or indirectly at Israeli interests. As part of the deal with Iran, the US wants to lift more than 1,500 sanctions. Tel Aviv, of course, expresses deep opposition to such a scenario. However, in addition to Israel, maintaining the status quo vis-a-vis -vis Iran is also in Russia's interest. Now, this is for a number of reasons. Firstly, it keeps Iranian oil out of global circulation, thus leaving more of the market for Russian oil. In addition, it forces Iran to look for partners, a role which Moscow is willing to fulfill. Also, as mentioned before, it is mobilizing Tehran to seek leverage in the region through its proxy groups, with whom the Kremlin also often cooperates. Thus, the US-Iran deal is not in the interest of either Israel or Russia. Iran's nuclear facilities were attacked in early April of 2021, and Tehran has blamed Tel Aviv. Now, the background motive might have been to sabotage talks on the lifting of sanctions on Iran. So far, the Viennese talks, mediated by the European Union, are still ongoing. If they lead to a total lifting of sanctions, it will certainly lead to a change in the balance of power in the region. The People's Republic of China China's involvement in the Middle East has grown steadily over the past two decades, and the recently announced $400 billion deal with Iran has been expected for a long time. The Chinese primarily see the region as a supplier of natural resources, an area of expansion for their Belt and Road Initiative, and a potential market for their products. The Chinese view of Israel is slightly different from the states previously mentioned. Sino-Israeli relations are deepening on many fronts, and this is especially true in soft areas such as economic cooperation, education, and tourism. Israel's high-tech sector attracts Chinese investment, while its location along the Belt and Road Corridor further strengthens Israel's appeal to the Chinese. However, in foreign policy and the military sector, both countries remain very assertive due to the conflict of interests in relation to the United States. Beijing is also looking closely at the tense Israeli-Iranian relations, especially in the context of their aforementioned agreement with Iran. As of now, however, we cannot talk about a Beijing-Tehran axis. In 2019, China imported over 650 million tons of oil from the Middle East, but only 18 million tons, or 3% of this oil, was sent to China by Iran, despite the fact that China was one of the few oil outlets for Iran. Saudi Arabia, a close ally of the United States, continues to be China's largest economic partner in the region. That is why the Chinese play a multilateral game in the Middle East and are trying to build links with Tehran's many rivals, including Israel and Saudi Arabia. Paradoxically, the interests of the Chinese and Americans in the Middle East are largely convergent. Both are committed to stabilizing the region and preventing conflicts. China would then be able to expand economically deeper into the region. Americans, in turn, can then devote resources to directions of action that are more important from Washington's perspective. Nonetheless, both Iran and China do agree on one thing, limiting the power and influence of the United States in the region, which is not in the interest of Israel. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, in practice, another point of convergence of the interests of Washington and Beijing, where both sides want to resolve it. China now chairs the UN Security Council, where it calls on both sides to make peace. At the same time, they accuse the Americans of a lack of objectivity, both in assessing the situation and of favoring Israel. The Republic of Turkey the Turks are also calling for the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, taking the side of Palestine in the dispute. Ankara was the first country with a Muslim majority to recognize Israel's independence in 1948, but recently, Turkish-Israeli relations have been very bumpy. 
By pursuing an offensive regional policy, Turkey is falling into isolation in the Middle East, which has also led to a deterioration in relations with Israel and the United States. Despite this, Ankara and Tel Aviv have been able to separate political issues from economic ones, resulting in a steady increase in trade between Turkey and Israel. Nonetheless, at present, both countries continue to maintain cold diplomatic relations, without a diplomatic mission at the ambassadorial level in either country. Erdogan recalled his ambassador to Israel in 2018, after Trump recognized Jerusalem as the nation's capital. However, the Turks have recently sent out signals that they would like to normalize relations once again, seeing Israel as a partner to help them normalize their relations with Washington. But as Erdogan has unequivocally sided with the Palestinians in this conflict, Turkish-Israeli relations are likely to deteriorate again. Osmanlı'nın yıkılışıyla barış ve huzur iklimini kaybeden pek çok coğrafya gibi Filistin toprakları da zulümle, acıyla, kanla yıkanıyor. The Turkish president has said that resisting Israeli aggression against Palestinian cities and Jerusalem is a debt of honor to all humanity. For several years now, Turkey's aim has been to play the role of the leader of the Muslim world, so any other position towards the Palestinians would be contrary to this policy. In Israel, there are voices saying that Turkey wants to take over the guardianship of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, Haram al-Sharif, which is currently under Jordan's supervision. As a result, the distrust will increase ever more, and normalization of relations will remain a distant prospect. During any major conflict, world opinion and leading diplomats call for peace and ceasefire. However, the leading motivation for the actions of individual players is always the interest of the state. This is not a good or a bad thing, it's just reality. And it's no different now, where, behind the facade of diplomacy, there is a tough competition for influence and for each state's own position in the Middle East. This was the 20s report. Hello to the new viewers of the channel. I hope you will stay with us longer. If you want to support the Good Times Bad Times channel, you can do so through our Patreon page. Big thanks of course go to our long-standing supporters. That's it for today, have a good week and see you in the next episode.